Hello, so this is the last in the series of videos on uh, the metallic theory of bonding and band theory. So in the last video we learned about semiconductors and what makes them different from conductors and insulators. Now it turns out that semiconductors still don't conduct electricity very well and you might want to improve that so that they conduct electricity a little bit better but maybe not quite as well as a full conductor. So how would you do that? How would you adjust the size of that band gap to make it not so large? Well, you do that with a process called doping. Now, we've heard a lot about doping in the um, athletics field, you know, things like blood doping and so forth. Well, this is different, sort of. So, in doping, what you're going to do is you're going to take your um, semiconductor material, let's say silicon or other types of material, and you're going to add an impurity to that. So, it's interesting that impurities can help change the properties of materials. So we're going to add an impurity element. That impurity element is called a dopant. So I've underlined some important vocabulary words here, doping and dopant. So the dopant is the impurity that you add. Now that dopant needs to have some characteristics. First off, it needs to be about the same size as the host material, so about the same size as a silicon atom if we were talking about silicon. But it needs to have either more or less valence electrons than the host materials. So let's consider again pure silicon. So you'll remember from the last video that there is a filled valence band and an unfilled conduction band and that there's a smallish band gap between those. Turns out that the band gap um, is about 1.11 electron volts. Electron volt is a unit of energy and you can look up conversion factors if you wanted to convert that to kilojoules per mole. But anyway, so this is a small to medium sized band gap. Still substantial enough that you have to put in a good amount of energy either through voltage or heat to get those electrons to transfer. So let's say we wanted to adjust this band gap to make it smaller. Well, one thing that we could do is dope the silicon. So we'll melt the silicon down, we'll sprinkle in a little bit of phosphorus into the silicon, and then we'll let it slowly crystallize back out. What's going to happen is that when we make the crystal, there will be some of those um, silicon atoms that will be replaced by a phosphorus atom. I have an example, I don't know if you can see it so well, of a crystal lattice where we've done some doping. So um, right here, I've got lots of silicon atoms. So silicon atoms, like carbon atoms, form four bonds. One, two, three, four. Right here, connected to three silicon atoms. One, two, three. I've doped this with a boron. So this boron changes the uh, way that these guys share electrons because it can only form three bonds typically. And so this dopant then changes the properties of this material a little bit. So now we've inserted this phosphorus. It's about the same size as a silicon atom. And what phosphorus has is five valence electrons. So those extra valence electrons have to go somewhere. And it turns out that the orbitals in um, phosphorus are a little bit different than the orbitals in silicon. And what happens is we create a new little band of orbitals, molecular orbitals right here, due to the um, electrons from phosphorus, due to those phosphorus atomic orbitals that we put into the mix now. So this band is now filled with some extra electrons that we've gotten from this phosphorus. And so this is the valence band due to phosphorus, and it's also filled. Now because we have more electrons, even, even though the substance is electrically neutral, we say that it has gotten more negative charges than it would normally have, five valence electrons instead of four. So because of the excess of negative charge, we call this a N-type semiconductor. N for negative. So notice what's happened now. Now we've got this filled level and how much energy would you have to put in to get it to the conduction band? Well much less now. We've narrowed that band gap. So adding this phosphorus as a dopant has added new molecular orbitals at kind of an in-between energy which has narrowed this band gap. And so now we've made an improved semiconductor that is a little bit more electrically conductive. We can also do that by adding a substance that has fewer valence electrons. So in this case, we're going to dope the silicon with gallium. Now gallium, if you look on the periodic table, only has three valence electrons. This is the case where we have less valence electrons. So now what we've done, we have done is we've created some new places for electrons to go, new virtual orbitals 
that come from gallium and those orbitals have different energies. So we have a new empty band, a new conduction band that's due to the gallium. So now we've got these electrons here that are in the filled valence band of the silicon and they can hop up here into this conduction band that's caused by the uh, gallium orbitals. And so again, that band gap is much smaller. So by adding dopants of the right kind, we can reduce the band gaps and improve the electrical conductivity of the semiconductor. Let's look quickly at how this last case works. So when you have less valence electrons than normal, so we've got three valence electrons for these galliums that are substituting for some of the silicons. Uh, because of that, we say that you have these positive holes. Now, it's not really a positive charge, but it's easier to sustain those. So we call this P for positive a P-type semiconductor. So when you have less valence electrons, this is a P-type, P for positive. And you can tell from these pictures how these are different. So let's look at how gallium works as a semiconductor. So now we've got gallium doped silicon. So mostly silicon atoms, we've thrown in a few gallium atoms. So now we've got this empty acceptor band that's due to the gallium atoms, this conduction band. And here's the donor band right down here. This is the valence band of our gallium doped silicon. And now these electrons could, if have enough voltage, pick up some energy and be promoted into that conduction band. Now when that happens, they leave behind a place where there's less electron density, so they've moved into a different orbital, and so these are called holes. So what's left behind when an electron gets promoted? And they're called positively charged holes. So we have these negatively charged electrons up here in this conduction band, and these positively charged holes here. Now it's possible for electrons down here in this part of the valence band to hop up here and uh, fill in that hole, and these guys can move around a little bit. So um, that's how conduction works in a gallium doped silicon. So let's do a quick example. So this question asks, when germanium, GE, is doped with arsenic, maybe we'll cover this up for a second, is this an N-type or P-type semiconductor that is created? So let's look at the electron configurations of germanium. So here's germanium. It has atomic number 32, and here's its electron configuration, 3d10, 4s2, 4p2. So if we count the valence electrons, the n equal 4 shell is the outermost shell, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 valence electrons. And here's arsenic, that's our dopant that we're putting in, the impurity that we're adding, and it has 3d10, 4s2, 4p3. So the outer shell is the n equal 4 shell, and we've got 1, 2, plus 3, equals five valence electrons. So in this case, we have one more electron in our dopant than we do in our host semiconducting material. So we will remember from our picture that when you have more valence electrons, remember electrons are negative, so we're gonna think negative, so this is gonna be an N-type semiconductor. So there's our answer, because we have more, more electrons than host, this is going to be an N-type semiconductor. And so that's how we work problems like that. So I have one